Hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening one and all. Thanks for joining us in this edition of LinkedIn Live. Um today we have an a very interesting topic to discuss which is all about integrating human factors engineering in cybersecurity. Before I kind of introduce our guest for today, I really want to understand from where you are logging in, from which part of the world. So if you can post on your on the comments from the place that you are logging in, that will be really helpful because we will then curate the content as well as uh, give you an option to ask the questions throughout the the next one hour of time. So I I look forward to seeing more participation, very interactive discussions today, and I I really look forward to um, a great session today. So I wanted to kind of introduce our guest for today, Dr. Calvin Nobles, uh, joining us uh, from Chicago. Uh, Dr. Calvin Nobles has been um, uh, a distinguished uh, uh, has began his distinguished career in the U.S. Navy. He served as a senior advisor on signal intelligence, cryptology, cybersecurity, and cyberspace operations on multiple military staffs and various assignments. Additionally, he worked in national security, supporting various military campaigns, and deployed on several occasions to support national and maritime operation throughout the military career. Upon retiring from the U.S. Navy in 2017, he embarked on a corporate career in the financial services industry. as a cyber security and information security subject matter expert calvin continues to advise senior executives on cyber security risk management and human factors engineering in cyber security many re- recognize him as a thought leader for his expertise in human factors and what a great opportunity to have him today with us uh, to share a few insights about the whole world of human factors engineering thanks dr calvin for taking time today and being with us i hope you're doing well and staying safe well thank you i i'm very delighted to be here today and again i'm very grateful for you to share your platform and your audience with me today as we discuss topics that are both dear to you and dear to me and as we continue to work towards really enhancing everybody's awareness about exactly what human factors engineering is and how we can leverage it in cybersecurity Now for viewers uh, I wanted to kind of put uh, across what we wanted to cover as part of an agenda um, so let me get a, a little bit of uh, insights of what we want to cover today um so we wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the human factors what are human factors you know what is the definition of a human factor uh, we wanted to talk about human factors engineering aspects and how can human factors engineers aid in reducing human induced risk because as we know a lot of times people put the blame on human beings and we hope that the technology will change the whole game uh, apparently it is not actually helping either ways so we really wanted to understand the essence of uh, this human error or human negligence as we kind of being uh, factorizing a lot of these is things is it actually going to be meaningful enough to to make it work and also a little bit about the dunning kruger effect in cyber security what does it mean what is its relevance to our viewers today and we'll have some plenty of time for q and a so that's that's the uh, part that we wanted to kind of uh, cover today so to get started uh, before we kind of kick it off what was your interest towards human factors what was the the aha moment that made you uh, specialize or spend a lot of time on the human factors of it is there any kind of a storyline behind that actually made you uh, deep dive into this uh, this aspect of human factors engineering great question absolutely when i was a young naval flight officer in the united states navy uh, i was I had the opportunity to go out to the navy post grad school and complete a course in the navy's aviation safety officer program and part of that curriculum there was a course in human factors now before i took that course in human factors at the navy postgraduate school it also was my first course that i took on the dr scott chapel who was a a leader expert who was also the co-founder of the human factors analysis and classification system in human factors and right. so by the time i had that class and by the time i had the class at the navy postgraduate school i was hooked 
you know, hook, line, and sinker, I realized that human factors was something that really interests me. And I really dug in and I really learned as much about it as I could. And as I transitioned from military aviation into uh, cryptology, signals intelligence, I realized that there were some paralleling effects and aspects. And one of them is that both of these communities, aviation and the uh, signals intelligence community, cryptological community, heavily based on technology. And so I realized that that social technical aspect of aviation was also it also existed in the national security side. So I was like, mm, this makes sense because if you understand anything about social uh, social technical systems, there's a huge technology aspect to it. There's a huge human aspect. Absolutely. And then they have to work. They they have to balance out because when they don't balance out, you create a gap on the technology side or you create a gap on the human factor side. And so it was very clear to me uh, that as I started you know, getting more and more uh, training and getting at my, my feet wet in cybersecurity, that this was gonna be a huge issue in cyber. Excellent. And, and as part of the, the whole view of uh, the human factors engineering, mm -hmm. give us a little bit of a rundown on what does it comprise of? So if you can take us to a little bit of a context of what has changed in the whole era today and why we need to be talking about integrating human factors engineering. Because I know for a lot of our viewers, this is the first time that they are trying to get a little more deeper insight to this um, episode. So it'll be great for all of us to get to understand how this, this is important and how does it change the way we work today. Sure, I'm very happy to paste us through the next couple of slides here. So I just go ahead and click on the next one. Anytime I give a presentation, I love giving a quote. And uh, these quotes about you know humans and cybersecurity, they are plentiful out there by very famous people. And so this is one of my favorite, you know, and I just, you know, again, this quote is all about companies are spending, you know, large amounts of profits and large amount of capital into building up, you know, the technological aspects of the cybersecurity infrastructure. But at the end of the day, we spend very little on addressing one of the major weaknesses or vulnerabilities in security, and that's the people aspect. You know, one thing that I noticed, and this was said by Kevin Mitnick, most of us know who he is, some love him, some hate him, regardless, you know, he made a very valid point here because, for the longest time, Kevin Mitnick specialized in social engineering attacks. You know, well before you know we you know we moved on to we went into the digital age, right? He was already you know perfecting this, and so I love these quotes because it helps you know build the baseline of what I'm trying to get out there. And my final point that I want to make on this slide is that when it comes to people, you know, as in cyber in the cybersecurity industry, we get so upset when people say humans are the weakest link. You know, I like to caveat and say that if you during a, a mishap investigation, you always look for the vulnerabilities, the critical failures, and the weakest aspects of the system. Right. This is not to say that in every investigation or in every accident or every you know, catastrophic event, it's going to be the same thing. It's right. a snapshot in time. And okay. so at, the, at any given time that something catastrophic happens, as investigators, you go and you look for what were well, the failures. In most cases, in data breaches, 90% of data breaches lead back to human error. Right. All security incidents, we're talking all security incidents, we're talking 80 to 90%, again, all lead back to human-induced error. And so what's really, what's really interesting is that we're not saying that people are the weakest link continuously. We're saying that at any given state, at any given time, a person have weaknesses that they might can't overcome due to various reasons. And so they might lead to something catastrophic. But I'm just like, I believe in what most other people believe in is that people can also be your strongest asset through proper right. training and a well of a well uh, seated program, a cybersecurity program, you can have people as one of your strongest assets. So I do believe in that. Yeah. But I do believe that any given time, any of us, can be a liability to our program because as people, we're fallible to so many different things. And so we, we have to understand that. So one, so question, so one question was, um, with all this human factors, I mean, the weakest link that you talked about where lots of millions of dollars being spent around it, is there a perception that technology would probably at one day 
eradicate the weakest link or we kind of betting on something uh, very um, difficult proposition uh, because there's one 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 school of thought that says that how can i prevent uh, human error can i make the systems intelligent enough that could predict some of those uh, mishappening that we were just talking about uh, or are we thinking that you know with all in all due respect you cannot cover everything because there is still an option of a a mishappening that is going to happen because of the human being so do you, do you, do you still vehemently oppose that technology cannot solve this problem excellent question excellent point you made here to a certain degree technology helps us especially sure. when we're talking about reducing some of the monotonous tasks we're talking about using technology for its automation purposes and as we see a growing effort in integrating and leveraging artificial technology i mean artificial intelligence all those things are helping us but for the greatest degree, technology alone is not enough. There's research done by researchers at MIT who said that we're in a technology-induced cycle where we're constantly inducing new technologies. Every time you introduce new technologies, you bring about more changes. You bring right. about more people. You bring about more procedures and processes. All those things are already built, and then you're building on top of existing processes, procedures, and technology. So what happens over a, a, a essence, what happens over time is that you, you begin to inundate people. And what happens when you inundate them because of all the changes, the constant change to, through the new technologies that you're integrating is that people begin to have a degradation in performance. Right. And so when they have a degradation in human performance, that leads to human error. And when we right. talk about human performance in cybersecurity, we're not talking about human performance and the people's ability to do their job based on HR standards. We're right. talking about human performance in the terms of stress, fatigue, distraction, right. and burnout. And there's many right. others, but those are the four that I primarily talk about consistently. Those are, we, we, we don't have enough conversations around human performance in cybersecurity because a lot of these, you know, a lot of these human performance issues that I just named are induced by security and technology leaders who are completely oblivious to the fact that they're inducing those human performance issues. Sure, thanks. Thank you. And so on this slide, I'd like to talk about, you know, the two definitions. So we have a working definition of human factors, and then we have a scientific definition. And so I love breaking down like this because if you read most literature, even when we talk about some of the blogs, even on LinkedIn and social media, when people talk about human factors, they really reference the working definition. And that pertains to human behavior with information security and, and data. In most cases, it's kind of negative in nature. We'll talk about human errors, mistakes, non-client behavior, and et cetera, right? I'm okay with that definition because it, there is something known as when we try to look at human factors, what are the human factors? And a lot of time it leads to just human behavior in a cyber environment or in a tech or a digital environment. Right. But what very few of us really want to get to, and because there's very few people in the United States that got their hands involved in the scientific definition here. This is the scientific definition where human factors is recognized as a scientific discipline, where we are looking at improving systems through optimizing system design. That's going to give us better human behavior and performance when we engage with information security systems, technology, policies, procedure, digitalization, whatever it may be, because what we're doing, we're building these systems based on the limitations and the weaknesses of human capacity. And we're right. doing it to make sure that we're able to complement the end users and the workers rather than allowing that human weakness and limitation to cascade into the system. We're trying to design to optimize to get the best end of that human performance out of that. And so that's why human fight, that scientific definition is so important in this aspect. Absolutely. So I have a question and thanks. Simone has actually joined in. Certainly all company policy and requirements is always focused on the negative. For example, the HR for employee under discipline or leaving. So any comment on that, uh, Dr. Calvin? Absolutely. You know, when we, when we talk about policies, you know, policies are designed to actually drive up certain behavior. Right. 
But again, policies by themselves are, are not going to give you that optimum behavior that you're looking for. And so, yes, the HR aspect of it is very negative. When we're talking about policies here, we're talking about cybersecurity policies, information security policies, sure. for instance, where we say, for instance, your password must be you know, 12 <laughs> characters or more. Especially, you can only use these special characters and numbers. We're talking about that. We're saying that you can only have one concurrent session at a time. We're talking about those type of policies. We're not talking about the HR policies. Sure. Because you know, every time we talk about human factors, HR comes in. Let me to be very frank with you. HR can't fix this for you. If yeah. they could have, they would have. They can't. They're not, they don't have the wherewithal and the professional training to fix human factors in cybersecurity. And so now, should HR be a part of this? Absolutely. And we'll get into that later when we start talking about some of the, I'm going to get, I'm sure I'm going to get questions on the human performance issues and how HR can play a role in addressing some of the human performance issues like fatigue, burnout, stress, and distractions. But okay. I'd like to continue here with, this is a definition of human factors engineering. You, as you can see, it's really close to the, the human factors definition. So I really want us to let this sink in. Human factors engineering is a scientific discipline that's been used. I don't want to give away the next slide, but it's been used extensively in other communities like healthcare. It was born out of military aviation in the United States. It's been used in nuclear power and nuclear energy engineering. It's been used in industrial safety systems for a, a very long time. And you see it's really about designing systems that we really cult cultivate these systems around people the tools and the technology as well. And we account for the work environment. We have to account for the work environment. Like for instance, the one question that I ask cybersecurity professionals all the time, when you all integrate a new piece of technology, how do you cultivate it to your working environment? How do you take into account your already existing environment and make it work? And so most of them say, we don't, I don't know how we do it. And so what happens, we implement technology on top of technology, and what we get is what we call in the science world, the after effects. After effects come when you implement technology, and then you see the issues with that technology that also, in most cases, increases risk for your organization. Correct. And so human factors engineers also give us the two important sentences are at the bottom here. Give us the ability to look for the hidden needs of the end user, because a lot of time, End users don't have a representative that's really looking at things from a human center aspect. And then it also helps us account for unexpected interaction between the system and the end user. So it's kind of like we go going out and we war game in situations before we implement technology or before we make policy changes or before we do anything regarding changes that's going to impact you know, the, uh, the, the workforce. And this is very important for us to do because it reduces the after effects, it also reduces risk after the, the technology or changes are implemented. Yeah, two, two questions I think came in. I think you answered one already, one from Kalidas. Do you recommend technology to adapt to human behavior or the other way around? I mean, you just touched upon that part of uh, the element and also uh, Simone's follow-up question after effects, you mean after the shocks that happened uh, would that be the the case in place? Um, That's, she, she's a she, she's exactly right. That's what we. I love the way she put that because it is like after the shots because we got these issues now. We thought we were going to integrate. And, and let's be honest about it. Companies implement technology to help them reduce risk, right? right. And to help show up their weaknesses and their vulnerabilities. So That's what we really do. But there's always some after effects because there's no such thing as you know interoperability with zero after effects. There's right. always going to be some aftershocks, as she put it, that we're trying to uh, manage at the end. But when we try to war game it before, or uh, just do you know some brainstorming initially to try to see what some of those after effects are going to be, it makes the integration easier. And so on the first question I put up there, you know, there's two, there's there's two scientific, there's two theories at play. One of them is social determinism meaning society drives the changes in technology needs. And then there's, there's other one called technological determinism. And, and that means that, you know, technology is driving society. There's a little bit of both of that's going on right now. 
we are in a technological boom. Even during COVID, we, were, we stayed in that technological boom, especially in, in the security and technology side, where there's so many different types of technology that's been developed. Some good, some not so good. Some We have varying opinions on what technologies are good and bad in our right. particular space. But so when you look at it, some people make the argument that it's social, uh, social determinism. Some people make the argument that it's technological determinism. You know, I think there's a little bit of both going on there. And sure. so we, but the, the heart of it, for at the, at the heart, we try to implement technology to complement humans, the workers. And in some cases we implement technology to reduce workers um, from that particular work because it's so monotonous. And then we have the ability through automation and artificial intelligence to have it done at an optimal level through technology. Sure. And then one of the things also Simon just talked about is uh, when you talk about preparation, right? I mean, we talked about after preparation, after shocks. Is that a kind of an environment where simulations are kind of replicating some of the common problems, some of the common scenarios? This is going beyond the business continuity plan and disaster recovery plan, which we have more like a tabletop test. In. And today we are talking about chaos engineering kind of an effort. So is yes. that kind of the preparation, uh, Dr. Kelvin, that Simulations are helping us to to navigate some of those problems well beforehand, uh, so that we can take into cognizance of some of those human factors when we design systems. Absolutely, this is that's exactly what we we need to be getting after. And so, simulations can be an amazing tool we, that organizations use. And you know, for instance, I was working with a student group a couple of weeks ago, and they were trying to replicate an environment, and they did it through digital twins. What I love about the digital twin approach is that now you can throw different scenarios at that digital twin to see what the response is and how the real system will respond. I love that approach. Now that is something most organizations are not willing to do or some, some do to a certain degree, but most organizations don't. But I think wargaming it, simulations is another one. Wouldn't we, I would love to, I love the fact when we talk about security awareness, instead of having training where you click on it, you, enter, you click on it and you go into a simulation. And in that simulation, you do everything that they ask you not to do as right. part of your training. You, you create a weak password and then your password get, you know, it, it get exploited and then it becomes, you know, it's gained by the uh, adversary. And then you get to see what the adversary is capable of by gaining your logon credentials, right? And then when they say, hey, don't plug in a USB device, you plug in that USB device and you get to see what happens, the, the exactly. downstream cascading effects. And this is all simulation. I believe that this type of training is more effective than the training that we're getting today. Right. The one thing that concerns me about all of this in cybersecurity is that there is never enough training about how do we get to the left of boom. It's all about the right of boom. All right. The attack happened. Here's what we know. Here's what we're going to do. We have to get to the left of the boom and stay there. And so right. things like this can help us get to the left of the boom and stay there. And so I think these are really uh, great questions. I want to uh, hone in on this slide for a little bit. When we look at engineering disciplines in cybersecurity, the, what I like to ask everybody is which discipline came first? Well, that's a good question. I'm just on the, on the note that if you look at the slide, let us know which one came first. Is it the cybersecurity engineering, computer engineering, software engineering, or network engineering? By the way, if you've just dialed in, please let us know from where you're dialing in so we get to know from which part of the world you're dialing in, and we'll be more than happy to see a global audience, right? So put on the comment window uh, about how things are. But uh, let's find out from the question Dr. Calvin asked, which do you think was the first thing? Uh, it's like a chicken and egg story, Dr. Kelvin, to see yes. where we can actually find out. But let's see uh, if someone makes a guess on what would be the, the aspect coming in. And and as people are coming in, there was one more question that Simone actually asked was, I understand we have um, engineering, I mean, but at core, engineering is common focus. We engineers, our world and one work is still a human endeavor. Do you feel we can remove the silo barriers when we talk about engineering from a human perspective? You no, know, to be honest with you, uh, when we talk about, you know, I, I just answered by talking about 
you know, human factors engineering. Human factors engineering is a balance of psychology, hmm. engineering, and your social sciences, right? And right. so if, if you go to school to take, undertake a study in human factors, you might take it in the psychology department. You'll take some of the classes maybe um, in the engineering department. You'll take some of the classes um, maybe in your computing or computer science department. And so what we're really talking about, this discipline is really a multidiscipline approach that brings everything together. But you're right, though, the engineering aspect of it here, what I'm really trying to drive it towards here is that, you know, we have, we are really sold on these fields in engineering. So the other question I ask on this slide here is, when we have a cybersecurity problem, we go to a cybersecurity engineer to fix it. When we have a computer engineering issue, we go to a computer engineer to fix it. We have a software or application problem, we go to a software engineer. A networking issue, of course, we go to a network engineer. But when we have human factors type problem, who do we go to? Right. That's a great Everybody, question. Everybody, all these other disciplines have never been trained to really answer comprehensively or to help you drive towards finding those human factor solutions. No offense to them. I love these people dearly. And I, I worked with them my whole career, but they just don't have the, that, you know, that word of thought to really solve the, those in-depth human factors problem. So, and that's what I love about human factor. It applies to everything. It, it applies to healthcare, aviation, HR, you name it, you know, supply chain, logistics, you know, teaching, academia. Human factors is one of those disciplines that is always present because it's really about designing systems and environments to optimize the performance, whether it's, yeah. if it's a pilot or whether it's a teacher, or whether it's an engineer, or whether it's a banker, whatever it may be, that's why this field has been so so successful and so applicable to other social technical domains and reducing catastrophic incidents at high levels of risk. Right, and there was a couple of people responded. Kalida said it is computer engineering that he says as probably the first um, you know one from the part. Um, <laughs> one of the things that Simon actually talked about was we had boxes and tried to hang them together and make them talk as um, computer engineering and the other stuff inside the one. So that's kind of uh, what people are kind of uh, looking at this one. Um, so we'll, we'll we'll move on on to that uh, in terms of the, the 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 meat of what does it mean? What aspects do we? If I need to dissect the whole human factors element. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and this is going to be a very it's it's kind of a loaded slide in my opinion because there's mm -hmm. so much aspects to it but let's mm -hmm. let's give that what we call as the peeling of onion and saying what does it comprise of and and and, and how do we uh foster this in a real world situation because there's so many moving parts to the whole puzzle and uh, frankly everybody is kind of focusing on process and technology elements while people talk about people as part of the first thing, it's it's assumed, you know, they'll get on board. It's easy to get on board. Let's focus on the most other aspects of it. So so I think this is this is a kind of the way that I think we should get and then um, process it. So help us understand this a little more better on what does it mean when you talk about human factors? So when we talk about human factors, you know, this is a... Uh... I developed this course, and there's only, there's only two schools I know of that really teach a full immersion of human factors in cybersecurity. Illinois Tech, uh, Illinois Tech is one of those uh, universities. And so when I put this course together, it was really tough because I'm like, what do I teach? What do I bring together? I got students for about 12, about 12 to 13 weeks before they get into their you know, preparations for their finals and, and, and the course projects. So what do I need to teach them? And so these are some of the things that I teach them. And I'm trying to get them to really have a in-depth understanding of what human factors bring to the table. I'm not trying to make them experts. I just want to raise their awareness about right. the human aspect in cybersecurity. And we talk, for instance, we talk about human uh, human error analysis and mitigation. So we talk about when people make errors, just don't leave it at that really low level. How do you walk that error and the foundational cause of it back up to the different levels of the leadership of the organization because 
rarely do one thing cause anything catastrophic to happen. Typically, we get into things like the Swiss cheese model, where several active failures or latent failures align that leads to something catastrophic. And so, and then we, I'd give a very in-depth lecture about human performance, where we talk about, you know, fatigue, stress, burnout, and we talk about distractions. You know, I read a lot of, I've been reading a lot of articles lately about, you know, a lot of chief information security officers saying they're burnt out. I don't believe they're burnt out. I believe what they are experiencing. They're experiencing a heavy dose of stress and fatigue. Okay. And there's a difference. When you're experiencing burnout, you feel there's different factors. When you're experiencing burnout, you have no desire to even come to work and do your job. Those are just some of the symptoms. But there's so many symptoms that you have to cross off in order for you to be in that burnout threshold. And right. this is why I know People are not in the burnout threshold. When you ask them, well, how long do you need to recover? They say, oh, I just really need a couple of weeks of solid rest. No, 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 no. Bur with burnout, you need about three to four months to recover from right. burnout. Right. And that's totally disasso disassociating yourself with your work and things that other things that might be causing that and just fo are solely focusing on yourself. So a lot of times what they're experiencing, they are experiencing a high level of fatigue and stress. And right. so that's what we talk about in uh, human performance. And we talk about uh, cyber psychology. Why? Cyber psychology, believe it or not, has been around for 10 years. And this is where the academia community, we're kind of slow to ramp this up. And so we really don't know what to place cyber psychology. Do you place it in the psychology department or do you place it in the, you know, the School of Engineering, the College of Computing? Where do you really place it? And to be honest with you, cyber psychology really is about just understanding the online behavior that when people are, you know, of people are using digital tools, the internet, yeah. you know, smartphones or whatever. Because a lot of us take on a different attitude. Well, I should Absolutely. say a lot of us, some of us do, right? And so this is what this is really about. And then, in order to really understand human factors in cybersecurity, you really have to understand some of the same requirements that cybersecurity professional, you have to you have to know the threat landscape. You have yeah. to know what cyber situation awareness, you have to have a deep understanding of cognitive hacking and social engineering. And then the other thing that we talk about is how do we do human risk analysis, where we actually really focus on the human element. I mean, aside from the traditional security assessment and that, comp that uh, companies and organizations do on an annual basis, how many of you actually do a human risk assess a human risk assessment where you say, okay, uh, we want to solely focus on you. What's your stress level? You know, right. how do you how do you gauge prioritization? How do you gauge the technology? How do you gauge the training we have? How do you gauge our security awareness? You know, are you fatigued? You know, do are you experiencing any you know traits of fatigue? How distracted are you? And this will give us a better understanding of the human element and how it's induced in that particular uh, environment. And so this is how you teach all of this. You teach it and you give students a, a better understanding. Um, I'm currently really working on how do I take the same course and give it to executives to help give them more understanding of what human factors engineering really is in cybersecurity so that they can be aware and now they can start saying, you know what? We have had a seat at the table that's been vacant, and that's been that human factors engineer. And we need to get some people in here that's going to help us understand how do we better understand people. We say we well, want we think. Well, I, I, I like this one because I'm I'm little surprised at why organizations or institutes are not offering this course. Because you told me that there's just about a couple of um, colleges or uh, institutes like the Illinois Institute of Tech is doing this course. So I, I'm surprised, Dr. Calvin, because this is absolutely needed uh, for everybody because irrespective of where you are, um, just in a point of cyber psychology, um, today we are kind of paranoid about if a youngster is going on to a web, what mm -hmm. are the likelihood of things that could go wrong? They are not aware, right? Mm -hmm. You cannot just tell them that ignorance is bliss. Because the, the moment is going to be so uh, um, you know catastrophic if you don't really uh, keep in mind uh, some of those aspects. So there has to be a, a, a constant endeavor to reinforce from the beginning of the do's and don'ts when you are looking at it. You know, 
we just tell about anything that you put on uh, an online medium cannot be retraced back. So just that mere factor itself is becoming a lot more uh, important for people to do it. So I totally get this one. And I'm hoping that this will drive more institutions, more academics to come there and get this as part of their uh, formative career itself. Because guess what? If we don't really inculcate these principles from the beginning of my uh, days in undergrad and grad, I'm not going to be an effective individual when I go back to the office. So it would be absolutely imperative for people to gain that perspective from the earlier part of the life cycle. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, one of the things I, I talk about when I talk with parents is that due to cyber psychology, you have 35-year-old men who become 12-year-old girls. And right. you have 12-year-old girls who become 25-year-old women. And so the reason I say that is because when people get on the internet, they take on these arterial you know, motives, these arterial you know, personas. And, and we have to account for that. And that's why I think cyber psychology is so important. It's because when people develop these you know, these false personas online, those same employees go to work for you one day. And sure. so you have to be very mindful of that. Sure. Excellent. And, and here I just want to talk about the morphing of human factors. You know, <clears throat> and I just give you guys a little background on human factors. Human factors have been around in the United States since 19, the 1940s. It was born out of military av aviation under the field of engineering psychology. And it's been it's existed ever since. The one thing that we're beginning to see, though, we're beginning to see it morph into other topics. Like, for instance, in computer science and some of the IT programs, it's called human-computer interaction. But they only are teaching it from a user interface aspect. They're not really teaching uh, the foundational principles of human factors. And then now you're beginning to see UI and UX uh, over in the UK and over in Europe and Australia and, and in Canada. They don't really refer to it as human factors. They really refer to it as ergonomics. But then, right. then inside of the academia world, there's some, some discussion about what really is er the difference between human factors and ergonomics. It's, we use them interchangeably, but some scientists and some researchers break it out even a little further and say that ergonomics really is the, the dealing with the physical aspects of the human element in a particular environment. So. We also begin to see it called usability, like usability, uh, it's called usability and privacy. Right. And some aspects of human-centered design, uh, human systems engineering, cognitive engineering, it's morphing. And my concern with it morphing is that are we getting away from our foundational principles and practices of human factors? And that's why I believe we don't see more courses with a total immersion and human factors in cybersecurity because people say, well, we have this course. Well, you might have the course, but now let me make this argument. You need to make sure that the person that's teaching it has a thorough understanding of human factors and have the right uh, credentials to teach it because you wanna make sure that you're grasping it from a level that's gonna help students and different audiences understand that at the end of the day, we're really trying to reduce risk. A couple of uh, people have joined in and just wanted to that. Alberto Suji is joining from Nigeria, Africa. Great insight. Thanks, Suresh and Calvin, for great insight. Thanks, uh, Alberto, for joining us. Um, uh, yeah, there's a couple of questions coming in, but let's let's take that after we go into this most important part of the Dunning-Kruger Kruger effect. So enlighten right. us with this whole story. So I, I love this slide, and, and I love this uh, this theory. And we, this theory really came out in 1999, and it really we I see this a lot when it comes to people talking about human factors and the human element and and, and cyber and cyber security. I used to be a lot more vocal on LinkedIn about it, and I realized that we're suffering from the Dunning Kruger effect, where people really think they have a better understanding than what they really do. I, I'm telling you, I've been studying this immensely for over 10 years. And, and I can tell you that when I start having this conversation with people, a lot of times I just let them take the conversation and go with it because they're showing me how little they know about it. We haven't done enough research as cybersecurity practitioners. And I say that because I got more time as a cybersecurity practitioner than I do as an academic. And so right. we really have to do the work. That's why during the earlier slide, I, I talked about the definitions. 
And so if you notice those two definitions I talked about, one was a working definition and one highlighted human factors as a scientific discipline. We really got to do our homework and get to the point to where we recognize it as a scientific discipline. If we don't, what we're going to be showing here on this slide here is that in reality, we really have a low level of competency and really understanding what human factors really are and what it really means. We're trying to move to a point where we're trying to address what we what I call human-induced risk in cybersecurity, but because people only have the working definition understanding of it, and the working definition only just describe human factors, it does nothing to move the needle to the right. Well, right. the scientific dis discipline is all about moving the needle to the right and keeping us to the left of the boom of a cyber attack or maybe or something catastrophic can happen. And so this is why this slide is so important. You have to immerse yourself in a knowledge area to enhance your, your understanding, educate yourself on this so that you can develop the competency you need to really be able to speak more intelligently, intelligently about the subject. And as I will say it now, as an academic, we have failed because we haven't pushed hard enough to address this problem in practice. The human element issue in cybersecurity is a sustained issue, has been sustained for well over 10 years, and we've done very little to correct it. Our research should all be about helping solve problems in practice. And so that's why a lot of my writings and a lot of my research uh, are really about addressing some of these issues. And the first one that I'm trying to address right now is misconfigurations in cloud computing. Right. It's, it's increasing significantly and we've done very little from an academic side to really understand it. And so that's why I'm taking that on. Just to show, just to highlight it is that every time we write something on cloud computing misconfiguration, it's about the architect of cloud computing. There's not one study where somebody said, I'm gonna go talk to the cloud engineers. I'm gonna go talk to the cloud computing profession. I wanna know it firsthand from them why there are so many misconfigurations. The right. only way that we're going to get a more in-depth understanding of that is, is to go and talk to the people that deal with it and see it yeah. on a daily basis. And so this is what kind of keeps us in that Dunning-Kruger effect is where we don't go and do the right research. We don't look to help address problems in practice. And that is what in academia, we really need to have a better grasp on the practices issues such as the human element and like misconfiguration error so we can get out of this Dunning-Kruger effect and start driving towards some practical solutions. Excellent. And to be honest with you, when it comes to, you know, the human element and, and cybersecurity, the true enormity of it is we're only looking at it from a very sur superficial surface level, right? To be right. honest with you, it's the iceberg effect. It's much deeper, much more comprehensive than what we really think it, we think it is. And our scope has been too narrow. And because of that, we continue to see problems with human errors and just human-induced situations where we that's leading to catastrophic events. And we need to get beyond that. And so this is why I think this slide is so important when we talk about you know, the human element and human factors in cybersecurity. Excellent. So there's a couple of questions that are kind of coming up. So I'm going to kind of pop that up as we uh, come over. Um, in extreme environments, I understand the depth of psychological training to cyber managers, teams. But what about general business? I find that uh, I find the care factor psych 101 focus of the human factors is negligible at times. Where are filters? Who has the responsibility for what we put out in tech? How do you ensure that security is everybody's responsibility? It's quite a loaded question from Simone, but you're kind of getting that uh, drill on what is driving it to it, right? You know, I really, I really love this question, and and she's right. She she hit the nail on the head. Who's advocating for the end user? You know, who's advocating for technologies and different things to come out? to say and to look at how it impacts end user. Now, I will say this, when, when I teach human computer interaction, I teach my students to look at, when you are looking to develop or to engineer something, you need to look at the masses, 
you know, uh, the other day I was in a, a restaurant in the airport and I was eating lunch and you had to order the lunch menu through a pop, bring it up through a QRC code. Right. There was three elderly women came in and they were lost. And the manager at the restaurant tried to kept try to keep telling them, you got to bring up the QRC code. You got to bring up the QRC code. And when the waitress came to my table, I said, hey, ma'am, do you mind helping the elderly women over here? They don't understand this technology. And right. you all should have menus on standby got to it. help people who might not understand the technology as well as we do. Absolutely. And so she's right. We, we develop things and we use things and we don't account for everybody. And that's why I believe in the, in the, within the next five years or so, we're going to start seeing companies hire, hire principal human factors, engineers at a very senior level who can come in and advocate for the human element across the organization, not just in the tech world, not just in the uh, security world, but across the organization. Because think about it from a banking aspect. Now we have open banking. That is a whole nother phenomenon that's going on that's yes. going to scare the, you know, that's going to really scare cybersecurity professionals, but also from a human factors element. How do we ensure that the bank account owners really understand what bank open banking really means okay. and the risk associated with that? And so that's why I believe we're going to have to bring in more people with this type of understanding and, and, with the, and the training that I've been through. And I will tell you, I'll be completely um, transparent about this. We don't have enough people in this country with training in human factors engineering and the cybersecurity training to make it mesh. And so we're gonna have what I what I like to propose is that we take human fact we take cybersecurity professionals and put them through educational programs so they can gain the knowledge in terms of become a human factors engineer with a specialization in cybersecurity. Well, this is outstanding, and I like the way that you talked about. There's not enough amount of people who are able to comprehend human emotions. I mean, you talked about a very important point where someone coming to the restaurant and asking for a QR code, you have no freaking no idea about what they are talking about. And we don't even empathize with the person mm -hmm. on the other side because they have from a different background and they get lost because they are traditionally used to read the menu card and pick up an order and, and place that. And they kind of find it very difficult to do that. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's a part that I think is going to be a very important aspect of it. And and people are kind of interested to know, is this kind of a training uh, virtual for, for more of the people if they want to undergo training? I know that you teach in academic institutions like Illinois Institute of Tech, but is that a kind of, because we need this more, as you rightly said, if we need to create more uh, people who have cybersecurity knowledge, but also go through an academic program, to understand what kind of personas are we dealing with it. You can have one of the most intelligent of the species, the human beings itself as one persona. And you can also have someone at the fag end of the spectrum who do not even understand what these moving parts are and what is IT and tech. So you can have a broader spectrum of people who are being so savvy technically and the other end of the spectrum to be absolutely clueless about it. So to... to to weigh and augment it between two different extremes, is it also a part of a personality that is needed, uh, Dr. Kelvin? Because one of the things I'm struggling many of times is there's no dearth of people who are intelligent, but we probably lack emotions. And I love what Jack Ma says, right? It's not about IQ. It's not about EQ. It's about LQ, love quotient. You moved away from intelligent quotient to emotional quotient to love quotient. That means, do we respect the other person as an individual? And, and we all have this philosophy in India that we bow uh, the divine within you. So it's kind of a respect of a, as a human, humanitarian first before we get to that. But to that point, do you think that there is, has to be certain personality, the attitude that has to be in place before someone can drive this human factor element? You know, I, I would tell you, I, I, you know, I just quickly thinking about all of the other human factors professionals that I know, huh. and most of us just want to help. Most of us are very inquisitive, right. and we want to help solve problems. 
Right. You know, regardless of what the problem is, we're willing to come to the table, roll up our sleeves, hear you out, and start discussing how we can, you know, start driving towards a solution. Right. And I think that's the most of us. The other thing is you have to be someone who really enjoys getting into literature because, right. you know, how do we stumble up on this? We all stumbled up on this by just going through our regular fields and just realizing that we had a common love for this. And I've been working with some of them for about three or four years now, which is not a long time. And we just continue to put the message out about this. Um, we, went, we recently went to an academic conference to talk to you know, uh, the information technology departments about why you know, courses like human factors should be taught you know, and it should be more. And we're talking about how do we create a curriculum around this where you, know, you can get a specialization in human factors and tech or cybersecurity. And we're trying, we're just starting and we're trying to get there. And you know, anybody who really has a passion for people that's the other thing. You got to have right. a passion for helping people. You know, when I see people burnt out, when, you know, when I see people stressed, when I see people who just hate their job, right. my first question I'm, I'm asking them is, what's causing you to hate your job? Right. Because I'm trying to get an understanding. I'm trying to help them. And I'm trying to, you know, understand where they are. I'm trying to meet them where they are, right? right. And and that's what, and that's what we, are, we are all about. And overall, we're really trying to work and get to the left of the boom that I talked about. So we never have to deal with the incident response part, right? And so we can always stay to the left of the boom. The, our scale should always be heavy to the left and less on the right. Because the more we do in preparation, we never should, the, more, the least we have to do on the right side of it. And to answer the question that Simone asked, is there more of this? I'm working with two other researchers right now we're looking to put together a course for executives and senior, and senior managers on this particular topic. Maybe a one-day course. We hit everything really high level. We understand that senior executives and senior managers are extremely busy, especially right. in today's environment. But we right. do want to give them something to to give them something to ponder, something to think about when they sit in there and it was like, why are we always having these human errors? You know, why don't we understand fatigue? You know, why don't we understand so many other things? And so. Okay. When, when I talk to organizations, I always tell them some things that you can do now to help you tremendously is you can look at putting together what I call a human factors council. You can put different representatives from your organization together for each one of your lines of business, and you can let it, you can put a senior executive or executive in charge of it to give it teeth. And then you can start looking at your human based issues that you're having in your organization, especially around cybersecurity. The other thing that most organizations don't even realize, they have a user experience team. Right. And that user experience team is always externally focused. Right. I challenge them. Take that same team, give, take about a fourth of it, and have them to look internally right. through the same lens to assess your cybersecurity and your technology program so you can get a better understanding of what your issues are around your people. Because your people come before your customers, because your customers are building and designing and serving your customers. And so I just believe that we haven't been very collaborative enough. And part of that is that when we talked about that, uh, that uh, us not really knowing human factors as well as we know it. And, and I tell you, one of the things that really surprised me is when I have this conversation with people that work in this field, a lot of them are really turned off about this discussion because one, they don't know it as well as they think they know it. And my job is not to you know, reduce them in any way. My job is to compliment them and say, let me help you gain a better understanding and a better picture of what's, of what's really going on. And so we, because most right now what we do, we say security awareness, uh, some type of cybersecurity training, and policies and technology, all of these things, the culture will give us the ability to eliminate human risk or human induced risk. Not so much. You have to have a concentrated effort to reduce human risk inside of organizations led by somebody who understands the human element, who's been trained to go in and look at the risk that's associated with the human element and coming up with practical solutions to resolve it. We have to 
change our aperture about how we look at, you know, cybersecurity. It's not very inclusive right now because you got a very important field sitting outside saying, coach, put me in. And that's all human factors engineers want to do. We want to help. That's what we come to the table to do is help. Right. And that's what we want to do. So one of the things that you really mentioned and that kind of resonated with me was the human beings sometimes resist. I know we, we generally tell people don't resist change, mm -hmm. but people resist being changed. Yeah. So when you are trying to push something very hard, either as part of the policy or cybersecurity controls and with all your ISO 27001, PCA DSS and all these controls in place, people don't understand why some of those behavioral aspects is not really taken. Why do someone behave like that? For example, tailgating could be as simple exercise where people say, hey, you know what? I don't want to hold on that. I just leave it. Someone comes in, it's okay. So people kind of get along in a way of working through certain ways. They kind of trust people as they are. They don't ask the questions. Does this particular person who is coming in has an ID card and has an access card to go on? Because they don't think this is much more difficult. There's, there's a kind of a delicate balance in terms of trust being established towards, you know, are we putting our, our organization at danger because we don't validate this stuff? So to that point of risk as part of it, will that also be that the human factors will become a, a very important risk assessment framework where people say that as an organization from a culture perspective, with these kind of personas, these are the risks that exist today in your ecosystem. And to your point, it has to be constantly reinforced because this is after COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened prior and after is another thing because everybody is now working remotely with public Wi-Fi and, and stuff. It also puts some things under risk in terms of uh, connection. So do you think there will be a world where as we look at an enterprise risk appetite, there will also be a time where we need to get a clearance from the human factor officer saying that these are the things that we think have to be handled from a psychological and cultural element of the company for us to make sure that we left no stone under. Because this seems to be much more important uh, in the context of where we are today with all different hacking and data breaches that are happening around. It's going to be instrumental, isn't it? You know, I, I love the way you say, you know, the, the human factors officer, because I, I do envision that being a position, especially some of our larger organizations. Uh, it, it might be a contractor. It might be somebody that they bring in as a principal. It might be somebody they bring in at a very senior level. But I, I do believe that most organizations are going to get to the point to where we really need that. And this goes back to what I said earlier. Once we do the human fact, well, once we do the human factors risk analysis, that risk of that risk assessment that's really going to focus on the human element only then that human factors officer will have a thorough understanding of what the risks are what the gaps are and be able to work from there and the, the one of the reasons why people really resist change is not because people don't want to be changed it's because people are not part of that change process correct if you if you can bring people into that and this is why it's so important to make sure you bring in diff the different personas right. into that process of making that major change, then you can understand what the uh, what the hurdles might be or the resistance might be for different groups, and then you can work that those things out initially, rather than after you make the change and now you're dealing with the after effects. Right, absolutely. It's been a delight, Calvin. We have two minutes to go, so I'm going to get off. Um, if you have any questions, please put on the uh, 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 chat window to see if you have questions. Simon says, is human factor officer, HFO, or higher functioning operator? Um, so there are a lot of questions coming on as, as we see um, the, the whole um, thing across. Um, one final thought, Kelvin, is where do we head forward in the human factors? Where do, we, where do you think is going to be the future of human factor engineering? I think well, one of the things that we have to do, I think we got we have a lot of work to do on the academic side of the house. Right. We really have to bring it into the curriculum. We have to really bring it into different uh, continuing education programs where we offer you know, a one-day course to senior executives and maybe a two- to three-day course to mid-level managers to help get bring them up to speed 
on exactly what is human factors engineering. And then we have to hit the platform, human factors professionals like myself, we have to hit platforms like this, like what you're providing to me today. And then we have to get out on social media. We have to advocate more for it. But I'll be honest with you, one of the things that, you know, that we run into is that we run into very strong platforms to where we're, we don't have the voice that some of the stronger platforms have. Right. It's easy for some other larger platforms to campaign for something from a commercial aspect that's sure. not really going to bring about the change, the foundational change that we want. That's concerning to me. And the other thing that we have to do is that we have to start working with the different certification companies as well to bring about how do we integrate human factors into the certification programs so that people can have a better understanding. And now I know you get some people get this from a, the social, uh, the social engineering aspect. They get some of that training and some of the certifications, but we need more in depth training, and we need to make this training available to many organizations as possible. And I'm working with some researchers to make this happen, so we can provide that training to different organizations to make people. I don't want to say make people, but help people increase their awareness because right. I think that's the biggest thing is people don't have the awareness today of what human factors engineering is. Well, well, Dr. Kalman, this has been a fantastic enlightening session for all of us. There's a lot of interest around this one. We coined a word called human factor officer. I'm, I'm pretty excited to look out when I'm being there next week in Chicago to meet you in person. Uh, but also a lot of work from the academics. What we want to see is that when you put up a course, of things, we'd be more than happy to circulate it to the group here because everybody wants to get that understanding about uh, human factors. And 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 if we all can do a, our own bit to uh, revolutionize this concept, create the awareness, and bring in some more energy, I think we can do things miracle. I'm I'm sure in the next two years when we come back and do a next live section, we'd be far more in terms of an understanding of it. But I'm really looking forward to your research and the academic um, you know focus to make this a much more important topic that everybody is able to uh, be aware of and take some action. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelvin. Thank you, everyone. Simon Joe Moore, Alberto, uh, Kalidas, and all of them who logged in today from different parts of the world. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you all for this LinkedIn Live. Our next LinkedIn Live is going to be on 6th of December. Uh, stay tuned. We are going to get Rob to talk about IT for IT and value stream mapping. Uh, but it's absolutely uh, a pleasure for us to share knowledge with industry experts. And I hope you had some takeaways from today's session. Um, we look forward to seeing you more in our next session. And until then, stay safe and uh, all the very best. Thank you so much.